On the evening of May 6, 2014, a woman in her late 70s exited Lachey Hospital in Nice, south of France. Her name? Helene Pastor, the richest woman in Monaco. Helene was a senior surviving member of what is, in effect, Monaco's second dynasty. And it had been a bad year for Monaco's richest woman. But little did she know, it was about to get much worse. Two years earlier, her only daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. Then this year, her brother Michael died, leaving her as the last heir to the Pastor dynasty. And now her only son, 47-year-old Gildo, has suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed, unable to speak, and hospitalized for the last four months. And every day without fail, she made the 45-minute trip from her home in Monaco to the hospital to visit her son Gildo by his bedside. This left Monaco's princess, as Helene was nicknamed, often wondering, quote, if there is a god, end quote. Despite the bad luck she was having, that day, Helene received some good news. After almost four months in the hospital, Gildo would be coming home soon. So she makes her way to the hospital as usual. She arrived at Lache Hospital that Tuesday afternoon, driven by her longtime chauffeur, 64-year-old Mohamed Darwich. A few hours later at 7 p.m., she left the hospital and made her way back to where her driver was waiting. She got back to her black Lancia Voyager and got in the front seat. Her white Pyrenean Shepherd Bell took up most of the back seat. Her driver started the car. It slowly rolled forward as the street ahead was crowded with traffic and pedestrians. But in the shadows, a young man was lurking, watching the car very carefully. Helene's car had just begun to turn onto the main road, but traffic blocked them from accelerating, which made for an almost perfect choke point for an attack. Seizing the opportunity, the stalker jumps out wielding a sawed-off shotgun. He aimed it at the front passenger seat window, and with the squeeze of the trigger, fired twice. Lead and broken glass flew everywhere. Blood splattered the interior of the car. Helene and her driver were hit in the face, neck, chest, and abdomen. Her driver's foot slams on the gas and hits the vehicle in front of it. And just as suddenly as the shooter appeared, he vanished. A clean hit. Or so he thought. Doctors swarmed the vehicle, as Helene Pastor and Mohammed Darwich lay slumped over in the car, covered in blood. Miraculously, they were both still breathing. Both Helene and her driver were taken back to the hospital for treatment. Four days later, her driver dies, leaving Helene as a sole witness of the crime. She seemed to be recovering well, and her doctors didn't fear for her life. She had even been cooperating with police. But then, 15 days after the shooting, Helene Pastor was pronounced dead at dawn on May 21, 2014. What preceded was one of the most high-profile murder investigations in European history. The richest woman in Monaco that lived a quiet life in one of the safest cities in the world, gunned down in front of a busy hospital. Could it be a mafia hit? A business deal gone wrong? A disgruntled family member that didn't inherit any of the dynasty? Or was it something far more sinister? Whatever it was, it would shake Monaco to its core. Murder in Monaco. The assassination of Monaco's richest woman. The ultra-wealthy like Helene Pastor and everyone else that lives in Monaco get access to the best investments, advisors, wealth managers, and more. And who does the public like you get access to? Nothing. The best investments have always been reserved for the ultra-wealthy. And as they get wealthier, they leave the rest of us to fend for ourselves. That didn't sit well with some people, so they developed Titan, today's video sponsor. Titan is like the advent of commission-free stock trading apps but for hedge funds. It gives you access to an award-winning investment team in the palm of your hands, with zero performance fees, no lockups, a flat rate advisory fee, and record-breaking returns. Titan already manages over $750 million for over 35,000 plus clients that are just like you. All you have to do is download the app, sign up, deposit just $100, and boom, you get access to award-winning investment strategies for US-based stocks to international stocks to even crypto assets. Titan's unique time-tested strategy of identifying a rare species of stocks known as compounders and holding on tights has allowed them to outperform all the major indices and robo-advisors since their inception. It's not an ETF or mutual fund, and they don't just expertly invest your money. They explain everything by giving you court-sized seats with real-time video updates. All it takes is $100 to get started on your journey towards smart investing. Get started today at titan.com slash jake and get your first three months of expert investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash jake for three months free. The 
Helene Pastor was the only surviving grandchild of Jean Baptiste Pastor, a poor stonemason from Italy. Jean Baptiste had arrived in the south of France to find work as a construction worker. After more than 50 years later in 1936, some of the buildings he worked on caught the eye of Monaco's ruling prince. He commissioned Jean Baptiste to build a football stadium, and from then on, there was no looking back. Jean Baptiste's son, Gildo, started buying up waterfront real estate in Monaco after his father died. On these properties, he constructed luxury apartment buildings, from which the Pastor family fortune was created. And because of his father's friendship with the prince, Gildo and his children soon became very close with the ruling family. When Gildo Pastor I died, he left his real estate empire to his two sons, Victor and Michael, and to his daughter, Helene. And by 2014, both Helene's brothers had died, leaving her as a sole inheritor of a fortune worth more than $23 billion. Eventually, Helene gave birth to her daughter Sylvia, and then to her son Gildo, the one that was later hospitalized. Even though she was the richest person in Monaco, Helene kept to herself. She wasn't a social butterfly and almost never appeared at any Monaco events. It seemed the only things she truly loved were her children and her dog, Belle. Sylvia and Gildo received an allowance of 500,000 euros a month. At the time, that was the equivalent of 610,000 US dollars a month. Both siblings lived close to their mother in luxury Monaco apartments. So in a nutshell, Helene was a quiet woman who didn't seem to have any enemies. So who would want her dead? It was a question that baffled local authorities. The investigation begins. Because the shooting occurred in France, not Monaco, the Nice police force were the ones in charge of the case. But as soon as the investigation began, things went dark. Helene Pastor had no enemies. Her family and friends could think of no one who would want to harm her. Everyone in Monaco loved her, and no evidence had been left at the scene. Even Helene herself told police that she couldn't think of anyone who would want her dead. But then, just a month after her death, police announced they had arrested 25 people in relation to the shooting, and they claimed to have identified the killers. For a woman who seemed to be loved by most of Monaco, 25 suspects was a lot. Soon after the shooting, four taxi drivers came forward to share information with the police. One said he had picked up two young men from a Nice train station that morning. They had been traveling from Marseille, and he had driven them to a hotel. Another two taxi drivers said they had driven one man each to Larche Hospital on the day of the murder. And finally, a fourth taxi driver said he had picked up two men at the train station who wanted to travel back to Marseille. They had been arguing and eventually agreed to pay him 500 euros for the 100 mile trip. These two men, Samin Saeed Ahmed and Al Hai Hamadi, had criminal records, but no one knew who they were. So police kept searching. Eventually, they arrested the only two suspects that mattered, and it sent shockwaves through Monaco. The first suspect? Helene's own daughter, Sylvia Pastor, and the second suspect was her partner of 28 years, Wojciech Janowski. Wojciech Janowski was a Cambridge-educated Polish businessman and Sylvia Pastor's partner for 28 years. In 1986, he met Sylvia at a party in Monaco. At the time, she was married to an Italian industrialist, with whom she had a daughter. But her marriage was troubled, so it wasn't surprising when she quickly fell for the charming, well-dressed Janowski. Soon after meeting him, Sylvia moved back to Monaco, where she and Janowski raised her daughter. Everyone who knew Sylvia said she was madly in love with Janowski. They never married, but they did have a daughter together, born in 1997. Like her mother, Sylvia was quiet and reserved, but Janowski was the complete opposite. He was the man of the town, a philanthropist, socialite, and big spender, exactly what you would expect a rich man in Monaco to be. At the time of the murder, Janowski was the owner of a nanotech company and an oil business. He was also Poland's honorary counsel to the Principality of Monaco. Even though he was a successful businessman, Janowski seemed to have no problem spending Sylvia's money, which caused many arguments between Helene and Sylvia. He bought houses in London and Switzerland, purchased a yacht, leased a private jet, and started many businesses. All with Sylvia Pastor's monthly allowance. And Sylvia never asked any questions. She trusted Janowski completely. And Janowski knew how to please the crowd. His donations to charity led him to become the co-founder of Monaco Against Autism and was awarded the National Order of Merit by the French president. So on paper, he was a very impressive man. Then in the early 2000s, Janowski and Sylvia made a new friend, Pascal Duriak. 
he was a fitness trainer with dreams of opening up his own gym. And for more than a decade, Pascal Duriak was Janowski's trainer and Sylvia's masseur, and they became really close friends, to the point where there was very little Pascal didn't know about their lives. With this wealthy lifestyle, personal trainer and masseur included, everyone in Monaco believed Wojciech Janowski was just like any other businessman in Monaco, rich, powerful, charming with a taste of luxury. He was respected and liked by all of Monaco's residents, all except one. Motive to kill. Twenty-four hours after being arrested, Sylvia Passer was released, and police announced she was cooperating with the investigation. Janowski, however, wasn't so lucky. As police dug into his past, his facade as Monaco's favorite millionaire quickly eroded. Instead of studying at Cambridge University, Janowski had actually moved to London in 1971, where he had a few odd jobs and eventually worked as security for a casino. Instead of a background as a businessman, he was a glorified bouncer at the famous Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco, where he walked the casino floors to spot cheaters. His love life was filled with broken marriage after broken marriage, and his nanotech and oil company Sylvia and Helene invested in? They weren't doing well at all. Unlike the facade he engineered, Janowski was a nobody, a former employee, and definitely not even a millionaire. His impressive resume was an elaborate lie. And in 2012, the biggest existential threat to his lavish lifestyle came knocking. Sylvia was diagnosed with breast cancer. Now this was a problem. Because Sylvia thought her husband was wealthy, logically she assumed he'd be fine if she didn't leave him any money after she died. So she set her daughters to be the sole inheritors of her estates for when she died. This worried Janowski. Most of the pastor family died young, and if Sylvia passed, he would have to go back to being a pleb. Or he would have to start all over, finding a new rich single woman to woo over. And to make matters worse, Sylvia's mother Helene had never liked Janowski. She despised him, according to one of the lawyers in the case. He was friends with everyone and everyone really liked him, but Helene couldn't stand him. So if Sylvia died, he would for sure be left with nothing, so he concocted a plan. Sylvia's death from breast cancer was looming, but if she died before her mother Helene died, he would be left with nothing. However, if Helene were to die first, Sylvia would inherit her mom's billions, and then he would have a little bit more time to figure out how to transfer those billions to him, when Sylvia's time would eventually come. So an assassination was concocted, a very amateur assassination, but an assassination nonetheless. So Wojciech Janowski was hauled into questioning. All the police wanted to know is if he knew anything about the murder. But at first, he was being difficult and wouldn't answer any questions, which didn't inspire any confidence in the police that he was innocent. But just after four days of sleeping in a cell, he started to open up. Janowski admitted that he knew there was going to be a shooting on his mother-in-law, but didn't have enough information to tip off the police. Why you would not tip off the police or your own mother-in-law about a potential assassination if you cared about her is beyond me. And the police didn't buy it. And little did Janowski know, a few doors down in another interrogation room, another arrestee was telling a different story. Pascal Duriak, Janowski's close friend and personal trainer that we briefly mentioned earlier. Pascal confessed that it was them that plotted the murder, and it was always about the money. Here's how it went down. Soon after Sylvia was diagnosed with breast cancer, Janowski asked Pascal to get him a gun. He said he wanted to solve the problem of his mother-in-law Helene, but instead of getting the gun as he was asked, Pascal said he would handle it. At the time, investigators discovered that Janowski's bank accounts were overdrawn by $1.2 million. Janowski was in desperate waters to say the least, so Pascal and him started stalking Helene's every move. Soon after, they found out that every day without fail, she made that 45-minute trip to the hospital in Nice to visit her son. A perfect pattern to set up a hit. But for a man with access to so much money, power, and influence, Janowski was no criminal mastermind. 
He put Pascal in charge of arranging the hits, so Pascal told his girlfriend about the plan. His girlfriend went to her brother to see if he knew anyone, and finally Pascal was introduced to two men, Samin and Alher. They were offered the contract to kill Helene Pastor for 100,000 euros, and another 40,000 euros if they could also take out the driver. Their hope was that if they could make it look like the driver was the main target, and Helene was just collateral, it would drive attention away from them. Samin and Alher accepted. The day had arrived, and the two assassins left the city of Marseille and took a train to Nice, which is where rookie mistake number one came in. They bought the train tickets in their names, while not knowing that all French train stations were heavily monitored with cameras. They checked into a hotel and made rookie mistake number two. They took a shower and left behind a bottle of shower gel. Police were later able to extract one of the men's DNA from the bottle. After they were all squeaky clean, they traveled separately to the hospital to stake out the location, but they only wore baseball caps and no masks. Samin was the shooter, Alher the lookout. Helene and her driver pulls up near them, Samin attacks, and then the two men made their escape on foot, eventually taking a taxi back to Marseille. But this truth didn't come out easy. All in all, it took an entire four years after the assassination of Aline Pastor for Janowski to finally confess to the crime. On his final day in court, a crying Janowski admitted to everything. That he arranged to have his mother-in-law killed for the inheritance money. That all the businesses that Helene's money was poured into were frauds. And that his only objection was that he never ordered the death of the driver, Mohamed Darwich. In the end, Janowski was sentenced to life in prison. Pascal Duriak was sentenced to 30 years and Samin and Alher both got life sentences. Where are they now? After the sentencing of Janowski, Gildo Pastor Helene's son that was hospitalized, resettled in New York with his wife and children. Sylvia, on the other hand, Helene's daughter and Janowski's partner, has pretty much disappeared. No one knows much about where she is or what she's doing. Reports say that she has broken off all contact with Janowski. And Janowski? He lost everything. He even had to hand over his last possession, a Patek Philippe watch, to his lawyers to pay for their services. He is currently spending his life sentence in Le Bumit's prison, one of the toughest in France. To the residents of Monaco, the killing of Helene Pastor turned out to be what the French call a crime crepilou or a crime that is sparked by a motive as old as Monaco itself, money.